Good evening. My name is Ellis Simon, and I'm going to recreate a presentation I did on Thursday, February 11th, to the Oyster Bay Railroad Museum on moving freight on the Long Island Railroad. I'm going to get my presentation up via share screen in a few moments, so uh, please bear with me. So this is about moving freight on the Long Island Railroad. These are the topics I'm going to talk about. So everybody knows that the Long Island Railroad is one of the biggest passenger carriers in the world. It's the biggest by far in the United States. The one time it had a very substantial freight business. Fortunately, it was dwarfed by the passenger business. However, that freight business was uh, vital to the economic development of Long Island, uh, particularly during the suburban housing boom after World War II. And it also served several industries throughout uh, Brooklyn and Queens and New York City. Uh, the Long Island Railroad uh, had some challenges with uh, serving the freight customers. They had a very difficult operating environment. They didn't have long haul traffic. Uh, most of the business was inbound, uh, which meant that there were very few uh, cars that they originated and they had to ship back a lot of empties. Also, since the business was concentrated in New York City, uh, the uh, distances that they carried uh, the uh, freight were very short. Since we were on an island, they had to rely on car floats to interchange with the other railroads in the New York area. And uh, because the railroad was so busy with passenger trains, they had to keep the freight trains out of their way. Long Island Railroad started in Brooklyn in 1834. By 10 years later, they had completed their main line out to Greenport, which was a little over 90 miles away. But in 1857, Brooklyn decided to ban steam engines. So the Long Island Railroad started to plan a new line to the East River. And uh, 1859, they started uh, to work on that. That line today is their main line to Penn Station. And uh, when they completed that line, they suspended service to Brooklyn. They weren't the only game in uh, uh, the railroad business in the uh, mid 19th century. In 1952, they had a company called the Flushing Railroad that built a line from Flushing to the East River. Uh, they followed uh, Newton Creek as far as Penny Bridge, and then they turned north to go to Flushing. Fortunately, they went bankrupt in a few years. They reorganized themselves, calling themselves the New York and Flushing. And after a few more years, the Long Island Railroad acquired it, it turned around and sold it to another company, the Flushing and Northside, which was building its own line to the Long Island City waterfront. And after that was complete, uh, the uh, old New York and Flushing line became redundant. It's a third entity in the area, the South Side. They were going to build from the East River to Patchogue, about 50 miles out from uh, New York City. Uh, they wanted to use uh, trackage rights over the Long Island between the river and Jamaica, but the Long Island said nothing doing. So they built their own line that went to Bushwick and Williamsburg. Uh, unfortunately, they had to use horses to move the trains between Bushwick and Williamsburg, and that was very inefficient and slow. So after they completed their line to Williamsburg, they started to build another, another line to Long Island City. And they did that by acquiring uh, the remnant of the New York and Flushing between Laurel Hill and Long Island City and building a connecting line from Fresh Pond down to Laurel Hill. That line is now the part of the Lower Montauk line. Uh, the Bushwick branch is still in and it's still to this day used uh, for freight. So by 1873, there were three railroads and three terminals in Long Island City. 
Uh, however, by 1884, they had all merged into the Long Island Railroad, which was consolidating terminals. They had a passenger terminal on the south side and the freight terminal on the north side. As you can see from this map, uh, Long Island being an island is separated from uh, the mainland and from the uh, railroads that were operating there. They could interchange with uh, 11 different railroads in the New York uh, uh, market, uh, but they had to have a way of getting there. So they depended on car floats. They didn't have a physical connection until 1917 when the Hellgate Bridge opened. And since the freight traffic was overwhelmingly inbound, they had a lot of empties to ship back. Car floats operated mainly out of Long Island City. There were two gantries there. Uh, between them, there were four float bridges uh, and they can handle four car floats at any time. The floats could hold 15 to 18 cars and a tugboat, if they push two of them in tandem, would take 30 to 36 cars, uh, which uh, was not much less than the length of uh, typical freight uh, train in the early 20th century. Once the, car, the floats were uh, uh, tied up to the uh, uh, float bridges, a switch engine would move a spacer car up a float apron can, and pull the freight cars off the car float and bring them down to uh, A yard, which was a big classification yard in the area. It was hazardous work. Uh, if the uh, cars, if the car floats became unbalanced, uh, freight cars would wind up going into the river. And sometimes the uh, car floats would break away from the dock or from the tow and they would uh, drift downstream. And you also have situations like in the lower right hand corner where a uh, uh, switch engine collapsed, uh, caused a, a float apron uh, to collapse. A float apron was the movable part that connected the land uh, to the car float, and, uh, was raised or lowered depending on the tide. There were also car floats in Bay Ridge, the southern end of Brooklyn. Uh, they were accessed by an old branch of the New York Manhattan Beach Railroad, which was mainly built for taking people to the beach for, for day holidays. And uh, there was similar size operation in terms of how many barges they can handle, but the yard was more efficient so they can handle a thousand cars a day there. Uh, the yard and uh, the Bay Ridge float bridges were used mainly by the New Haven Railroad which acquired right, trackage rights over the Long Island's Bay Ridge branch in 1917 when the Hellgate Bridge opened. The Long Island Railroad was there mainly to provide uh, switching and local freight service. 1917, the Long Island also got its first uh, on land connection when the New York connecting the uh, entity that built the Hellgate Bridge and the connecting tracks. Um, completed the line to Fremont Junction where they uh, went on to the Long Island Railroad uh, Bay Ridge uh, branch. And at uh, Fremont, there was also a connecting line from the uh, uh, Fresh Pond Yard, the Long Island, and uh, which you can see in the lower uh, uh, right-hand picture. I'll blow it up so you can get a better idea. You can see the tracks cutting off and the switch engine will take the cars back to Fresh Pond. Um, <clears throat> 1969, the New Haven became part of the Penn Central Railroad and Penn Central downgraded the Bay Ridge line. They didn't need the car floats anymore. They removed the catenary, the overhead wires uh, to power the electric locomotives, but they still ran down to Fresh Pond only not now the cars were routed by a Selkirk yard up near Albany, which meant that there could be like a 300 mile detour uh, to get the cars to the Long Island Railroad. Uh, Fremont and Fresh Pond is still the primary interchange. Uh, only now it's for the New York and Atlantic. They connect there with the CSX and Providence and Worcester Railroads. 
There were several yards in Brooklyn and Queens, major yards uh, you see on the uh, uh, left and secondary yards and terminals uh, as well on the right. I'm gonna do the principal yards uh, first. First one you come to is Art Street. Uh, it was a classification yard for westbound movements, which meant cars that were gonna go onto the car floats to go to the different railroads. There were 21 tracks there, but they were short since they only needed to accommodate enough cars uh, for a single car float. Uh, there was uh, team tracks and an LCL freight station uh, in the area. Uh, the yard closed in the 1980s and uh, was later used to store rock salt for the New York City snow removal operations. And now the Art Street car shops are on the location. And here you can see uh, what uh, the yard uh, looked like in the 1960s, uh, the salt uh, piles and what was left of the yard after uh, the tracks were taken up. The big yard in the area was A Yard. It's the principal location for making up freight trains to different places in Brooklyn and Queens. It extended from Thompson Avenue out to the last siding on the, on the far end, which was the Johnson's Wax Warehouse. And it was right next to Sunnyside Yard, the big uh, passenger yard that the Pen Pen Pennsylvania Railroad opened in 1910 when they built uh, Penn Station. And on the north side of a yard, there were several private sidings that the Long Island Railroad uh, serviced, including MetLife's printing plant, National Casket, and uh, Ronzoni Pasta, my favorite. Here you can see uh, Sunnyside in relation to the A yard, A yard being up here, and you can see how much bigger the Sunnyside yard uh, was. Uh, the Long Island uh, Railroad was to the left of everything. And if you go by, you can look out the window and see what's happening in Sunnyside. A yard made up a lot of different uh, assignments, switching drills, which were cuts of cars for the local uh, industries. Uh, local freights would go further out into Brooklyn and Queens. They'd have a full crew with a caboose on them and hauler trains, which uh, moved uh, freight between A Yard and Holborn Yard, which is east of Jamaica. Uh, there, cars would be reclassified. Anything that was going east of J Tower in Jamaica would be classified a second time at Holborn Yard. And these trains ran several times a day in each direction. Up here, you can see one of the haulers. Here's an overview of A Yard in the 1970s, the hump they used in classification and a map of the classification ball. When Sunnyside Yard was built, um, the Long Island Railroad could no longer connect from A Yard to its main line. So they needed a different way to go. Uh, they built a line, short line called the Montauk Cutoff, which runs from Eight Yard to the lower Montauk line in Blissville. And if you look up at this picture here on the left, you could see the cutoff coming from A Yard, curving off to the left to go over to Blissville. It would pass over the main line tracks just east of the East River Tunnel portals. And the unique thing about this is that trains had to be make, made up in the opposite direction of their destination. So the train may be going east, but first it would have to head west to go across uh, the Montauk cutoff. The cutoff also provided access to Degnan Terminal, which is a major industrial area in Long Island City, and uh, was used to reverse uh, passenger locomotives on trains that were stored in, uh, or during the day at Long Island City. At Fresh Pond uh, Yard, which was connected to Fremont, uh, the railroad uh, classified freight that came from the New Haven, as well as uh, freight that came up from the car floats in Bay Ridge. There were two sections to the yard. Uh, the, to the left, you see the West 
uh, yard, which took care of traffic for uh, the Bushwick branch and also for some of the freight going uh, west on the lower Montauk. And the east yard uh, would classify traffic heading, the trains heading in the other direction. It's still used, it's the principal yard and headquarters of the New York and Atlantic today and where they interchange with uh, the other railroads that come into the area. The, as said before, the CSX, uh, Providence Worcester, and for a while, Canadian Pacific was coming uh, down there too. There's some of the action at uh, Fresh Pond, Conrail Freight uh, on the bridge over the Long Island Railroad. One of the Hall of Trains going over the, under the bridge, it's the New York connecting line up uh, here. A cut of cars coming back from Fremont Junction into Fresh Pond. And uh, one of the newly painted uh, New York and Atlantic locomotives uh, right after uh, the uh, Long Island Railroad uh, sold them to the New York and Atlantic. Down in Bay Ridge, uh, the New Haven freight trains were terminated uh, and originated. They came in on the, over the Long Island Railroad with trackage rights. Uh, they would transfer there to the car floats. The yard there could handle a thousand cars a day. The line from, Bay, from uh, Fremont and from Hellgate was uh, electrified in 1927, but uh, in 1959, the New Haven decided not to use the overhead wires, the catenary, so it was de-energized. Uh, they did a 180 a few years later when they were able to acquire some used uh, freight, electric freight locomotives at a very good price. So they turned the juice on and that lasted until Penn Central came in and Penn Central uh, uh, got rid of the Bay Ridge, the float bridges and uh, the catenary. And uh, the yard has since been rebuilt by the New York City Economic Development uh, Corporation, and uh, there are now two new float bridges down there. There's two pictures at the top. I'll give you an overview of what it looked like. The well, first, when it uh, opened in the 1920s, there's quite a lot of tracks in here. And then after Penn Central had uh, their fill of it, you could see just one section of tracks over on the far right. Here's the view from the opposite direction. Uh, on the left, it's a shot taken in the 1960s. There's a Long Island switch engine, uh, New Haven uh, uh, electric uh, locomotives over here. And uh, this is uh, pretty much the same view uh, in the modern era. I don't know what year this uh, photo was taken, but this is what uh, the yard looks like today. And we go out to Holbin Yard, which was the largest freight yard the Long Island had. It made up trains to go to Nassau and Suffolk, as well as Eastern Queens. Uh, it was located between the main line and the Babylon branch uh, of the railroad. And it got the name from a combination of the two towns that surrounded it, Hollis and St. Albans. And it was arranged that uh, there were receiving tracks and departing tracks uh, parallel to the main line, but the classification yard was pretty much at uh, a perpendicular to the main line. It was fairly big, had about 26 yards in its peak. Uh, it's no longer used for freight, now it's used for maintenance of way. And uh, the Hillside Maintenance Center, which is the big shop for taking care of the electric uh, uh, multiple unit cars is located there now. Oops, oops. Okay, this is the view from uh, the uh, overpass of the uh, Babylon line looking out toward uh, the receiving yard. Here's a shot from the other end of 
uh, taken on the, on the Babylon line, uh, the back end of the classification yard. Now we get to the secondary terminals. First, uh, Degnan Terminal in Long Island City. It was an industrial park uh, from the early 20th century that when it started had its own switching railroad. Then in 1928, the Long Island Railroad acquired it. It was still fairly active until uh, modern times in 1966. There were 29 customers there, according to this uh, map. And uh, it remained in service into the 1980s when finally the uh, switch off the Montauk cutoff was removed. Just gotta watch the cursor. Many of the buildings that Degnan served in the Degnan area had indoor sidings, cars would be pushed into them. Some of them also had elevators that would take the freight cars up to the upper level floors and they would be unloaded there. Blissville Yard was located alongside uh, the uh, Newton Creek, uh, just east of the Dutch Kills Swing Bridge and uh, before Greenpoint Avenue. Uh, at the east end of the yard, that Montauk Cutoff came in and uh, joined the lower Montauk line there. It didn't actually go into the yard, but ran alongside it. Uh, Blissville was used mainly to serve cars going to Help Stodge, Van Eiderstein, and some of the other customers in the area. Uh, they had a switcher assigned uh, to the location, and it was uh, drill the cars uh, for Phelps Dodge. Uh, in 2008, uh, the New York Atlantic Railroad rebuilt it, and doing so enabled them to discontinue use of uh, a yard on the other side of the Montauk cutoff. Phelps Dodge was the biggest freight customer the Long Island Railroad had. Uh, it was a copper refinery uh, that was started in 1905, became part of the Phelps Dodge Company in 1930. Uh, there were three uh, sidings on the property. They could have 25 car, freight cars there at any time. Um, I'll just real quick, I wanna show you uh, the uh, larger picture so you can get a better handle on how uh, large the complex was. You can see the Kosciuszko Bridge up in the uh, uh, top of the picture and also an ocean going freighter uh, here on Newton Creek, which I didn't know uh, you had uh, the ships that large running. So that was uh, giving you an idea of the kind of commerce that was going on in this area. Now, every day, the uh, Laurel Hill switch job would take the cars that were stored at Bliss, bring them over to Phelps Dodge, switch the plant, bring back any uh, cars that were going back to the mainland. Uh, the yard, Phelps closed in 1983, and uh, the buildings were subsequently demolished. I think there were a few industries that have crept up on the location uh, since. Not too far away was the Maspeth Yard. There were 32 private sidings in the area, including Continental Can and AMP, and also five team tracks. Uh, team tracks, I should mention, are where uh, first uh, uh, horse drawn carts, later trucks would come to load or unload freight uh, from uh, boxcars and other kinds of freight cars. That's how they got their name. Today, they're known as transload uh, facilities. And um, Maspeth was busy enough to require a six yard track, uh, six track yard where uh, uh, freight cars would be switched and sorted so they could be taken to the different uh, industries in that location. Atlas Terminal is another private industrial park. Uh, it's located in Middle Village. It is east of the uh, Fresh Pond Yard. Uh, 
Uh, it was named for Charles Atlas, the famous bodybuilder who was a Middle Village restaurant. And they had their own little uh, industrial locomotive, which you can see down uh, in the lower uh, right of uh, this uh, photo. <clears throat> it was a busy operation. They could uh, handle up to 60 cars a day. Um, they had some A-list tenants there, General Electric, Kraft, Westinghouse, New York Telephone. And that service ended in 1982. Uh, the property has since been converted into a uh, retail uh, uh, outlet called the Shops at Atlas Park. It's a very nice uh, outdoor shopping mall. In East New York, you had the New Lots uh, Yard. It's very, bi very big, over 400 cars uh, that could classify. It was the biggest yard between Fresh Pond and Bay Ridge. And it served uh, 17 customer sightings in the area. Uh, biggest one was the Brooklyn Terminal Market. They also did a lot of business to Sears Roebuck. Uh, the yard's no longer with part of the operation. The property is now part of the New York Transit Authority and they use it to store maintenance equipment. There we go. Bushwick Branch. Short, but uh, very densely industrial line. Um, was, as I mentioned, it was part of the South Shore line to the East River. Uh, one time there were 92 private sightings on there, two yards with team tracks. Um, as recently as 1977, there were still 77 sightings in service and also did a, a sizable business handling livestock movements. Uh, many of them would go to kosher slaughterhouses in the area. It's probably no one time New York City had the largest concentration of Jews in uh, the world. Um, Bohax had a the supermarket chain, had a big uh, uh, complex down there. National Can and Steel and Tube uh, also had some sizable operations in the area. Let me go back because I want to show you that one. I just want to blow this up so you can see how much action there was on this short line. Started here coming off the uh, lower Montauk and there was hardly space where there wasn't a siding. If you've read uh, The Great Gatsby, if you've seen the movie, you're prom probably familiar with the Valley of the Ashes. Corona Meadows is where the Valley of the Ashes was. It was located alongside Flushing Creek uh, between downtown Flushing and where City Field is now located. It opened in the 1920s. There were team tracks there and a small uh, storage yard. Uh, took care of customers uh, that had private sightings along the Port Washington branch. And also it was important to helping the railroad in service on its uh, unprofitable line to Whitestone. Uh, Long Island got its customers to use the team tracks instead. The yard stayed open to sometime in the late seventies or early eighties, I'm not sure of the uh, actual year. But in its last years, it was used uh, a lot to scrap uh, Long Island uh, Railroad rolling stock, passenger cars, including many of the uh, parlor cars that used to run out uh, to the Hamptons. In Jamaica, in addition to the yards and corporate headquarters and the shops, it had a lot of uh, freight customers. Uh, the freight activity was clustered around the Holborn Yard or just west of the Morris Park shops, which were the 19th century uh, shops for the locomotives and cars that the Long Island uh, had built. The biggest customer in the area was Ideal Toy. Hang on. Uh, 
go out to Nassau and Suffolk County. Uh, the yards were smaller. Primary role was uh, class car storage and team tracks rather than classification. Uh, trains were less frequent. They were also, many of them were shorter. And if you go out to the different towns, uh, there were team tracks all over the place. And many stations had uh, pole yards and uh, lumber yards. So uh, uh, they would deliver these cargoes to the different uh, towns. Oops. Some of the bigger locations along the line included New Hyde Park, uh, Mineola, where there was a uh, freight yard on an old uh, branch line that went down to Hempstead, as well as a dozen customers between Main Street and the Meadowbrook Parkway. Now most of those are uh, part of shopping malls. Another big concentration around Hicksville. Um, you had uh, sidings both to the east and west of the station on the main line and on the uh, beginning of the Port Jefferson branch, which splits off just east of the Hicksville station. In 1958, the uh, Long Island opened a new yard uh, in the area to serve a lot of the uh, freight business. A lot of this business actually had grown up in the post-war years, so they were fairly modern uh, plants out uh, there that were serviced by the railroad. Another area with a lot of that freight activity was Farmingdale. Uh, much of the business was uh, located in the Price Industrial Park, and today that's also retail, or I think that's more big box uh, retail. And uh, they were serviced out of a small yard off the uh, new highway in East Farmingdale. And uh, when I worked out there in the summer of 74, uh, they still had two shifts operating to uh, drill the different uh, sidings. Here's a train in uh, the new street yard and one of the uh, road freights uh, that would drop cars uh, here in uh, East Farmingdale. Pioneer was another uh, important location. We had Pilgrim State Hospital here and several uh, other customers. Now it's a uh, important yard for the New York and Atlantic Railroad. Uh, they originate uh, short freights that go east, both east and west of the yard. Uh, they connect with the road freights that come out of Fresh Pond. Out in Riverhead, there were 16 sidings, 16 tracks as recently as 1966. Uh, Riverhead uh, handled a lot of potato and cauliflower uh, traffic. Uh, during the harvest season, uh, most of these good uh, products, produce moved by rail. Uh, sometimes you can get as many as 100 uh, cars on the uh, westbound freight train, but it was uh, seasonal business, so it wasn't a very long uh, season that they had all this traffic. And that eventually went over to the trucks and uh, many of the farms got out of the, uh, the potato and cauliflower business. Uh, some of them became vineyards, some of them were sold for development. There you can see um, um, uh, some of the refrigerator cars for the potatoes being iced. And here you can see cars being loaded on the team tracks, that's the uh, Riverhead Station in the background. And that yard today is used to store the historic Long Island Railroad uh, rolling stock that's owned by uh, a few museums and uh, historical societies in the area, including uh, the Oyster Bay Museum has a, couple, has a couple of cars there as well. On the Oyster Bay branch, there was a neighborhood section Mineola called the Pole. It was bounded by the Long Island Railroad to the west, uh, Roslyn Road to the east, and uh, Jericho Turnpike to the south. Uh, there were a dozen customers in there, so uh, they were always getting uh, switched. And further up in Roslyn, uh, there were six online customers, including uh, Helena Rubinstein, the big uh, cosmetics firm. 
There were also team tracks, uh, passing siding, and a freight station uh, there. So that was a busy spot too. Oops. Come on, come on, Chris, where'd you go? Where'd you go? Oops, let's go back. Okay, on the Port Jefferson branch, uh, there was used to be a little station called Landia at the Robbins Lane Grade Crossing uh, just south of Syosset. Uh, there was a uh, factory there called Circle Wire, later became Cerro Wire. And um, they've been in the news uh, for many years because uh, after they closed, it was a brownfield and there were always plans to develop the site, but nothing ever came of it. Now they're talking about putting an Amazon warehouse on the location. And you also had a cluster of uh, customers in Huntington. Uh, there were 10 at one time, plus three team tracks. Now there is only one uh, active customer on the entire branch and that's uh, Fleet Lumber. <clears throat> there were little branches that came off the uh, Port Jefferson line at both uh, Northport and Kings Park. One time the Northport line went all the way down to the waterfront. It was uh, cut back over years. The last customer was Axon Lumber, which was just north of Route 25A. And uh, they uh, quit in uh, 1978. And a few years later, that branch was taken up. Um, out of Kings Park, there was a branch that ran down to the state hospital. It was used for freight, uh, mainly uh, delivery of coal for the power plant and passengers on the weekend, uh, family and friends of uh, 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 the patients uh, would come out by train from New York City. Uh, that line stayed in until 1987. I think that's when uh, Kings Park uh, Hospital closed. Gordon Middle, Mitchell Secondary uh, was part of what was known as the Central Railroad, which ran between Flushing and Babylon. Uh, it's a short section that connects up with what's now the Hempstead Line in Garden City. It ends at Indo Boulevard, which is a little bit west of the Meadowbrook Parkway. It also had a uh, small branch that went off the, over the Meadowbrook Parkway to serve a handful of uh, industries in that area. Uh, their big customers included uh, A&P, Wallbounds, uh, Mitchell Air Force Base until they closed, and uh, Newsday when they still had their operation off um, Stewart Avenue. Uh, the old Garden City Mineola Yard was moved uh, there in around 1970. It's no longer any uh, freight uh, traffic on the line. However, they still use it for work trains and uh, had seen a pickup in activity be due to the third rail uh, uh, project underway now. Uh, people knew it also for hosting the Ringling Brothers uh, Circus train when it came to Nassau Coliseum. You can see that uh, the layout of the tracks in the Gartmaniola uh, uh, the Garden, uh, uh, Garden City Mitchell Secondary, and blow that up. And here's one of the freights crossing the Meadowbrook Parkway, uh, the freight yard up here, and another freight train running along uh, the line. Another piece of the central branch that survived is the Babylon Extension between Beth Page Junction and uh, just west of the Babylon Station. And uh, in the area between Route 110 and Wellwood Avenue, it had a concentration of customers and there's still some freight activity over there now. And the Long Beach branch, you had the EF Barrett power plant, which was built by uh, Long Island Lighting. It opened in 1955. Uh, added a second unit in 1963. Um, it was coal fired, so they depended on uh, 
uh, cold uh, shipments. Uh, they had a yard uh, for storing the hopper cars that could hold 125 cars. They had their own uh, small locomotive to move the cars over to the conveyor. Which happens to still be uh, standing. And that locomotive was acquired by the Long Island when Wilco shifted uh, from uh, uh, coal to oil and gas in 1970. It became Long Island 397. And now it's part of the collection of the Oyster Bay uh, Railroad Museum. You can see it in our display yard. Um, it was a busy uh, uh, move. The trains came through two to three times a week. Uh, they could be anywhere from 20 to 60 cars pulled by anywhere from two to four locomotives. The West Hempstead branch had customers in the vicinity of Valley Stream. Some of them were served from the viaduct that runs from the Babylon line to just past Merrick Road. And also uh, you had an active yard in West Hempstead. There were several team tracks there and a few other sidings. At one time, the line continued up uh, to Mineola via the Hempstead branch at Country Life Press. Uh, there was a passenger loop train that would come out to Mineola, go down to Valley Stream via West Hempstead and come back uh, to Jamaica and New York. Uh, service on the, West, on the Hempstead extension ended in 1960. You know, I'll blow up the West Hempstead yard for you. It's the team tracks and the freight station over here, some of the sidings. Uh, and on the Montauk branch, you had uh, a lot of freight activity out in Amityville and Bayshore. Hatchard was a big freight center because they had the only Deepwater Harbor on the south shore of Suffolk County. And going back to the early 20th century, there was a yard there, they had a turntable, they had a dozen customers, they had their own sidings. Uh, best known was the Patrick, the Patchard Lace Mill, which received coal for the power plant and uh, raw materials uh, and uh, shipped uh, finished goods. Uh, the Lace Mill is north of Montauk Highway so to serve it, uh, the crews would have to flag traffic on Montauk Highway to get across. Bridgehampton, uh, the most uh, uh, freight traffic for all the Hamptons. Um, 1966, they still had eight customers. There were uh, three team tracks there. Uh, and also they were big in originating sand uh, shipments locally mined sand, there were still a few quarries out that way. In the 19th century, um, companies started opening uh, fish meal uh, and fish oil processing plants in the area along Napiag Bay between Amagansett and Montauk. And uh, the area got its name, was given to it by the uh, former slaves who were recruited uh, to come up from the South to work at the plant. It was kind of a uh, joke uh, that they had because they didn't think it was, this was the promised land. It was a very uh, smelly, uh, dirty operation. The last of these plants, uh, Atlantic Processing, uh, stayed in until 1968. And go out to Montauk, um, there was some activity on a former Navy site that became Republic Aerojet. Uh, their uh, sidings had capacity for 70 cars, but I don't think Republic ever used that many. I think they used the, the yard to switch uh, the uh, Montauk freights when they came in. Long Island handled a variety of uh, products. Um, as I mentioned before, the traffic was overwhelmingly uh, coming to Long Island, going east. A uh, relatively small number of cars uh, originated to go west. They handled a lot of lumber and coal, which I uh, alluded to before, as well as uh, cement and uh, fresh meat. And uh, they shipped out 
uh, canned goods, uh, potatoes, iron and steel products, and uh, petroleum products. Uh, many big companies had operations on the Long Island. You could see beverage companies like Anheuser Busch and uh, Canada Dry, uh, big retailers like uh, Macy's and Sears, uh, grocery stores A and P and Walbaums, food uh, manufacturers Ranzoni, Heinz. So it was a good mix of uh, companies that uh, used uh, the railroad. What happened? Between 1950 and 1977, 27 years, half the business was lost. And then in the following 19 years, about 75% of what remained was lost. It fell first from 94,000 to 47,000 and then to less than 12,000. As you can see in this picture at the right, uh, the freight trains were getting shorter and uh, less frequent. Number of reasons uh, for the decline. First, there was competition from trucks. Uh, better roads and new bridges were built, such as the Frog's Neck and the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. Uh, there was a big shift underway from coal to oil for home heating and power generation. The construction boom of suburban uh, build out uh, came to a close. Manufacturing declined, a lot of factories uh, closed, not just on Long Island, but uh, throughout the Northeast. Uh, then the MTA was more interested in its commuter business for obvious reasons. Now, freight doesn't vote. And um, service uh, deteriorated as they ran less trains. Uh, you could have cars uh, held up for several days also the mergers, the mergers of the Penn Central and Conrail, that didn't help the situation because you no longer had cars coming directly across on the car floats. They had to be routed up to Selkirk and then back down on the uh, east side of the Hudson River. So in 1997, the Long Island threw in the towel on freight. A new company, New York and Atlantic received a uh, franchise to operate the freight business. They set up their operations in Fresh Pond Yard. Their first year, they didn't do too well, a little over 9,000 cars, but by 2018, they had more than tripled that. They work with around 80 customers today, handle a diverse uh, range of uh, products, and uh, they interchange with CSX in Providence and Worcester. Uh, Norfolk Southern in New York and New Jersey, and the Brookhaven Rail Terminal out in Yapping, which is a uh, transloading logistics center. It opened in 2011. It also provides uh, warehousing and distribution services, truck rail transfer. It's a sizable operation. They have two and a half miles of track, which means that they can easily accommodate more than 100 cars. We're in a good location right off the Long Island Expressway. Uh, their biggest uh, commodities are agriculture, building materials, consumer products, and foods. And they did in 2019 approximately 3,800 cars, which represents more than 10% of New York and Atlantic's entire business. Some parting thoughts, uh, the Long Island Railroad Freight played an important role in developing Long Island and uh, the industrial base in Brooklyn and Queens. It was a complex situation with uh, many operating constraints, a lot of uh, switching going on, a lot of short runs. Uh, its decline resulted from many factors. You can't point to one factor or another. And the good news is that the uh, freight uh, business is rebounding on Long Island in the hands of uh, new operators, the New York Atlantic and Brookhaven uh, Terminal. So that's it. Uh, I'll get the sharing closed back.
just want to acknowledge uh, the sources of material that I worked from dozens of people's photography is in the uh, presentation. Uh, a lot of information from the Trains Are Fun website uh, run by Steve Lynch and uh, Arts Archive run by Art Hunnicky. And I uh, want to single out a gentleman named Robert Emery, who's no longer with us, but in the 1950s and 1960s, he created uh, the detailed uh, maps of the different uh, areas showing the locations of the tracks and buildings. Um, and uh, they are a fabulous resource too. So I thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something.